here. I'm allowing the motions to be moved because informal notice was given last night, albeit later than I would have wished. I know that the motion arises from decisions of the House of Commons Commission and has broad support across the House. It allows for wider participation in the business of the House and scrutiny of the Executive, which is crucial at this time. I also note that the Procedure Committee, in its report, which has been prepared at remarkable speed to assist the debate today, supports the principle of this motion being taken without notice. We now come. The motions on proceedings during the pandemic and on hybrid scrutiny proceedings will be debated together. I call the Leader of the House to move the first motion. Leader of the House. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I beg to move the motion on proceedings during the pandemic standing in my name. As we have explained, Mr Speaker, I will also speak to the motion on hybrid scrutiny proceedings. Mr Speaker, may I start by thanking you and the House staff for the incredible work that has taken place during the Easter recess to allow me to move these motions today. It is worth noting that our clerks and staff often work very long hours when the House is sitting and expect to be compensated for that in recess periods. On this occasion, we have asked them to work during the recess period too, placing a double burden upon them. I am also grateful to you, Mr Speaker, for allowing these motions to be moved without formal notice and to House staff for arranging the publication yesterday of these motions and the accompanying explanatory note. From tomorrow, if the House agrees these motions, we will resume oral questions, statements and urgent questions virtually. While the new digital Parliament may not be perfect, Members may launch forth into fine perorations only to be muted or snatched away altogether by an itinerant internet connection. We must not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. The parliamentary authorities have done a superb job to get this up and running at such short notice. Should the House agree these motions today, I would expect to bring forward further motions shortly in order that we can extend our virtual ways of working for a longer period and to more substantive business, including legislation. Before turning to these motions, I want to set out my gratitude to the Procedure Committee for its rapid work. These are difficult and challenging times, and these necessary changes are happening at a pace that would not be ideal in more normal times. The Procedure Committee has an essential role in advising this House on reform, and I am grateful to the Committee and to its Chairman for its report published today and commit to continue to working closely with it. We will all want to keep under review how these procedures work. I know that the Committee has particular concerns about moving to electronic voting, and I would certainly want to work closely with the Committee on the options for that, and I hope it will reassure the Committee if I say that I am looking to make certain that we initially schedule business that is unlikely to be divided upon once we have moved to considering substantive business as well. Of course, I'll give way. I'm, I'm, I'm extremely grateful to my right hon. Friend for giving way at this early stage. Uh, could he confirm that it is his, his intention tomorrow to bring forward a motion on remote voting? Um, um, Mr Speaker, I think we must wait for tomorrow for tomorrow's business, but I do expect further motions to be brought forward on how this House will operate and move forward to substantive business, and those motions will be laid in the normal way before the rise uh, of, of the House. Um, so that we do not have to have this extraordinary situation of bringing forward motions without uh, notice. But there will be further motions. Of course, I give way. Uh, Leader, for giving way, and obviously understand the extreme circumstances under which we are working, and commend the government and the officers of the House for what they have done. In his comments, the Leader of the House indicated that nothing controversial that would lead to a vote will try to be brought before the House. In those circumstances, is he guaranteeing? that nothing to do with extending of abortion in Northern Ireland will be brought to the House during this crisis period? Um, Mr Speaker, I was referring to the period of next week when we expect the business to be business that will be agreed without a division. We are looking to having um, remote voting, uh, as my honourable friend referred to, and motions will come forward, will have to come forward. Uh, to cover that, but at the point at which that is in place will be the point at which controversial business will be taken that is unlikely to go through without a division. We are not looking to divisions uh, next week. Give way to the honourable gentleman. I, I thank the, the uh, Leader of the House for giving way and giving us a chance to ask a question. Minister, you will know that on every occasion 
uh, Labour Taoiseach, no one ever case that we had any uh, controversial issues to do with abortion, that right honourable and honourable members, ministers, uh, uh, individuals from all different parties across this chamber said that on no occasion would any uh, thing, any legislation come with abortion whenever the Northern Ireland Assembly was working. I am very conscious that the Northern Ireland Assembly is up and working and working well. Is it important, uh, Leader of the House, that any legislative change should not be brought to this House at all at any stage uh, uh, that, that whenever the Northern Ireland Assembly itself could make that decision? And what I need, Mr Speaker, from the Leader of the House uh, is an assurance uh, uh, on the record that under no circumstances will any member of this House be disenfranchised and prevented from voting against abortion. And they're not just in my party, but in other parties across this house, there are many people who are opposed to that abortion change and certainly opposed to any change that would affect Northern Ireland when we have a working assembly to take those decisions. Uh, Mr Speaker, votes on abortion have always been free votes, and it would be astonishing if that were to change, and it would be a matter that I personally would not be in favour of. Um, these motions come from an Act of Parliament that was passed by this House last year, and the Government must follow the law of the land. But the assurance that I am giving, and I will be announcing next week's business in the business statement, is that next week we will not be bringing forward business that it is expected there will be divisions upon, because it is business which has been broadly agreed. Um, so I think I ought to turn now, Mr Speaker, to the motions themselves, and I am grateful to the House of Commons Commission and other parties for agreement to these measures. May help the House if I briefly set out the approach taken, and I would draw attention to the detailed explanatory notes that has been published for the convenience of members. The first motion commits the House to taking all steps necessary to balance its responsibility for continuing scrutiny of the Executive legislating and representing the interests of constituents, with adherence to the guidance issued by Public Health England and the restrictions placed upon all citizens of the United Kingdom. Though I fe feel I should say not citizens of the United Kingdom on today of all days, the 94th anniversary of the birth of Her Majesty, yeah. I think I should prefer subjects of our gracious Sovereign and take the opportunity in the absence of gun salutes to wish Her Majesty very many happy returns of the day. Um, but nonetheless, we must, as our subjects, be an exemplar in the process which we adopt to allow virtual working, and this is underpinned by this motion. As the explanatory note sets out, the main motion provides for the first two hours of each sitting, on Mondays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, to be devoted to scrutiny proceedings, defined as questions to ministers, urgent questions and ministerial statements, during which it will be possible for members to participate electronically in a form approved by you, Mr Speaker. The motion also enables the Speaker to restrict the number of members physically present in the Chamber and to ensure that social distancing requirements are met. And as I look around the Chamber today, I see that we have succeeded uh, in doing that very successfully. And I will um, give way to the Honourable Lady. Can I join the Leader of the House in thanking everyone who has worked so hard in putting forward these arrangements and raise the subject uh, because I do declare an interest because Mr Speaker has been kind enough to give me an adjournment debate on the order paper this week um, about adjournment debates which of course tend uh, to be rather sparsely attended at the best of times and urge the Leader of the House and the House of Commons Commission to find a way to have adjournment debates as quickly as possible so that we backbenchers can represent our constituents. Um, Mr Speaker, if I may, I'll answer that question in two ways. Uh, one is that we are looking to expand the digital offering so that we can carry out more business, hence legislation next week, and it depends how long this goes on for. The other part of the answer is that so no member is disadvantaged, members who can't come here. What we are not doing virtually, we will not do at all, beyond today and some motions that may have to be laid tomorrow. That's a point I was coming on to make. But it is only right that everything we do should be available to all members in a virtual format, as well as the small numbers who will want to attend um, personally. So in that process, adjournment debates will, I'm sorry to say, be at the end of the process rather than the beginning, because we need the scrutiny and the legislation uh, uh, further up um, the list. Uh, yes, of course, I give way. I, I thank you for giving way. For the last few weeks, uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of workers around my constituencies in factories, in paint factories and in manufacturing have had to continue to go to work in line with the guidance and have not been able to maintain those six feet, two metre distances 
to enable them to continue to do their job. And they have been told repeatedly that that is in line with the guidance and the guidance is clear that this uh, rule should follow where possible. If it is the case that we cannot do our job properly because people are limited in their contributions, are unable to ask supplementaries in the usual way, are we going to apply the same rules to us that have been applied to those working in paint factories and kitchen factories uh, in my constituency who are having to go to work regardless of the social distancing advice? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Mr Speaker, the same rules apply to us as to everybody else. That is the whole point of what we are trying to do, and therefore facilitating working remotely, but trying to ensure social distancing uh, within this House. Now, I noticed um, as we began prayers, and Mr Speaker walked in front of me about a foot away, somebody said that's not social distancing. There will be occasions, even in this House, where it is not kept to absolutely perfectly, which is within the spirit of the rules, as long as we are making our best effort to ensure social distancing. Hence, uh, the tape that has been put down uh, and the novel style of prayer card that we see in the seats to ensure that we are in the right places. And I think that is completely in line with the guidance given to the rest of the country. And if I may add, we have a twofold duty of leadership of members of this House. One is to show that we are following the rules that apply to everybody else. And the other is to lead by example in showing that we are getting on with our essential work. And I think, with the proposals that have been brought forward, uh, we are doing both of those. I give way to my so right hon. The point of leading by example on the, the rules that we've imposed on everyone else, I would point out to the Leader of House that we have never debated those rules. Those rules are implemented under uh, legislation passed presciently, as far as Orwell was concerned, in 1984, and we have never debated and explored them, and isn't that itself shocking? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, we had an opportunity to debate the emergency uh, legislation, and what we are doing today is ensuring there is the opportunity for debate and discussion and for the government to be held to account. I am providing for my right honourable friend what he is asking for before he even uh, asked for it. I, I do not claim the capability of um, second sight to have known what he was going to ask for, but I am delighted, Mr Speaker, thanks to your good offices, we are delivering for my right honourable um, friend. So, uh, as I was saying, the motion enables the Speaker to restrict the number of members uh, physically present in the chamber to ensure the social distancing is met, and the motion will remain until the 12th of May. And it is likely that arrangements may be modified um, following the motion tomorrow to a wider set of proceedings, uh, and that will follow. And it is temporary. That is part of the point of this. This is whilst this crisis lasts. And there are specific points where I want to provide reassurance. Uh, the motion at point 8.3 reads, following the conclusion of scrutiny proceedings, the House shall proceed with business set down to be taken at the commencement of public business and then with the main business. As I alluded to earlier, I want to make it clear that this is provided for to allow us to bring forward further motions that are procedural and that are necessary this week, including the motion to allow for substantive business. It is not the Government's current intention to meet physically to debate legislation or other substantive matters, but rather to wait until the House has agreed a way in which that business can be debated remotely. Uh, turning to C6 and 7, the motion gives the Speaker the power, uh, having agreed with the Leader of the House, that is me, uh, to vary this order. Now, that might seem a very sweeping power. But this is entirely to ensure that Mr Speaker can react to any teething problems that the new procedures may have. So I hope members will consider it a sensible uh, inclusion. It, it is not, Mr Speaker, so that you and I can set up some uh, form of um, railroading of parliamentary procedures, and it has to be within the requirements uh, of the motion that has been agreed. So to conclude, Mr Speaker, Parliament has always evolved to make sure it can work efficiently. Parliamentary procedure is not an end in itself, but a means to allow the institution to function successfully. Any changes now will be temporary for the period of the lockdown, because, like many things, the Chamber works best where members can meet in person. But I hope the whole House can support these motions so that the House can undertake its essential scrutiny, and we can then move to considering other vital business, including legislation. Parliamentary. Uh, of course, I give way to my right hand. Very grateful to the uh, Leader of the House for giving way. Uh, noting, uh, as he says rightly, 
these measures are only temporary, and I think we all welcome that. Uh, would he uh, assist by, uh, I wonder, agreeing with me that the real spirit of this has got to be that as the restrictions on the country are lifted over the coming weeks, uh, we should respond in kind, moving at least in step uh, with the increasing freedom of citizens in the country to go about their business, and we should show leadership in that respect too. Um, Mr Speaker, as a general rule, it is wise to agree with the Chairman of the 1922 Committee, and I am happy to say that on this occasion I do agree with my right hon. Friend. As the rest of the country sees its ability to do more become apparent, so we must be going along with that. And he kindly leads me perfectly to the point at which I want to end. What we do in this House is not something that it is nice to do, a frippery, a bauble on the British Constitution. It is the British Constitution. It is at the essence of how our governmental and constitutional system works. The ability to hold the government to account, the ability to seek redress of grievance, the ability to take up those matters brought to us by our constituents so that they may be put right, is best done when this House sits. In 1349, when the Black Death affected this country, Parliament couldn't sit and didn't. The session was cancelled. Thanks to modern technology, even I have moved on from 1349, <laughs> and, I'm glad to say, and I'm glad to say that we can sit to carry out these fundamental constitutional functions. And I'm enormously grateful to many who are just as traditionalist as I am, who have accepted these constraints, and you, Mr Speaker, who compete with me to be a traditionalist, I sometimes think. You, Mr Speaker, have been at the forefront in getting them to happen because Parliament, the House of Commons, is essential to how we are governed. Yeah. Yeah. The question is the motion on proceedings during the pandemic. I now call the shadow leader of the House, Val Rivers. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Leader of the House for opening the debate. Um, Mr Speaker, we are really, these are extraordinary times, and today we're debating a process that has shown how the House can move with these changing times. And I too want to pay tribute to all those involved. It has been an incredible feat on behalf of the Clerk of the House and the staff, the digital services, the parliamentary broadcasting team, They've all been involved, both in the technical side and in the paper that came to the Commission, literally drafting, refining, redrafting, which has led us to this motion today. And I, too, want to thank the Procedure Committee. I think they met virtually and made very, a very important contribution to the discussion that we had at the Commission. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Opposition wants to engage with the Government at this extraordinary time, and we consider that the ultimate aim is to move to the virtual parliament in keeping with government advice and public health England advice, subject to any technical limitations. Mr Speaker, you chaired the commission where we discussed, agreed and agreed this way forward, and this is the motion before us. We're effectively agreeing these hybrid proceedings, which is a combination of the physical people here, up to 50, and virtual, up to 120. Members will be treated equally, whether they're in the chamber or whether they're vir uh, virtually. Uh, there will be a shuffle and parity will be given to all the parties. There'll be no bobbing or supplementary um, points and, and certainly no points of order. And they're all laid out in what looks like, uh, I'd say they were the eighth, eight commandments. Uh, thou shalt, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt do this. But I just want to touch on one, which is under A. A2, which is uh, scrutiny proceedings shall conclude not later than two hours. Uh, and I wonder, I know the Leader of the House uh, and you, Mr Speaker, at the Commission, we thought that was mainly because of for technical reasons rather than a prescriptive limit. But that actually looks uh, to me to be in a very prescriptive way that the proceedings will end. Now, I do appreciate that, uh, say, for example, the parliamentary broadcast, there may be technical difficulties where they can't sit beyond the two hours. But I think if we could, if the leader could give us an undertaking that that's not as prescriptive as laid out in the motion, that would be very helpful. Uh, and, and that is literally what is going to happen, uh, isn't it, Mr Speaker? There will be people managing the time, and we've got to understand that certainly clerks at the table and anyone else uh, will have to limit their time here. Um, 
We note the consequent standing order changes uh, that apply to the prayer cards and the social distancing, which is, is here that we can see, and to the notice of questions. And I agree with the leader. The explanatory memorandum is really helpful in setting out what members should do in terms of applying for uh, their questions. So it's Monday to Monday, apart from for next week, uh, because we're meeting today, and so they have until Thursday to uh, list their questions for the following week. Um, I know that the staff of the House uh, and everyone else are working on how we deal with the debates and legislation. I look forward to the motion that's coming ahead. And also secure voting. That is extremely important uh, because we've got to make sure that any voting process is secure. We've already seen that there are um, emails, rogue emails, going about uh, apparently from the Department of Health suggesting that the Department of Health want um, uh, uh, social herd immunity. Uh, so we've got to be very careful in terms of how we vote. Uh, Mr Speaker, it's going to be an incredible time. There's going to be uh, a, a additional oversight, both from your office, the table office, and the WHIPS office, both sides. They're all going to be working incredibly hard to make sure that we can come into Parliament to, be account to, to hold the government to account and to uphold the democratic process. And as the leader says, this will only be effective until the 12th of May. Well, um, oh, yes. Next month. Uh, Can I uh, thank my honourable friend for giving way? Do you know, I wasn't sure I quite cured this, but I thought he said there can't be points of order. Now, I know this device can sometimes be badly used, but sometimes a point of order can point out an injustice or point to a procedural problem that does need addressing. So how can we ensure that this House does have the ability to shout alarm if it's necessary? So it's uh, a matter for Mr Speaker to take the points of order, and that is the wide discretion that he has under other parts of the motion. I think the key thing, and that's what came out in the discussion that we had, was that you cannot interrupt proceedings where members are up there virtually. It would be impossible to interrupt them as they're speaking with a point of order. There will be a, a way of working that. I mean, it may well happen, but it's entirely at Mr Speaker's discretion, and hopefully he will incorporate injustices that may occur in the chamber. But I want to just touch on, finally, I think, Mr Speaker, that you suggested that there might be a dress code uh, for the House, and certainly what goes on behind in terms of animals and children and wallpaper and all that, as we have, as we've seen. But clearly the dress code will only apply to the top half, unless of course it's, <laughs> unless of course it's the leader of the house, in which case I know that he sometimes likes to be horizontal. So in fact, the dress code <laughs> will apply to the top half and the bottom half for the leader. But I want to finally thank everyone for getting us to this position. And subject to that undertaking, Her Majesty's opposition support the motion. It might, might just be able to help on just some of the points. What I would say is it is a starting point. We want the resilience and to build up from this point. This isn't the end. This is only the beginning of going forward. And what I would say is, and quite right, the people have mentioned about digital and broadcasting. We cannot thank them enough. 700 years of this house doing it one way, suddenly to completely turn everything over and start in a new way. I can only thank them, but to reassure the Honourable Lady that we will be looking to increase the number of hours and we'll be looking to ensure that we can grow the virtual parliament. You're absolutely right, we can't do points of order at this stage, but give us time, we will develop and we will increase the capability. And I want to reassure the House that that is ongoing and discussions will continue to take place. And you're absolutely right on voting. No decision's been taken. We want to check that that is secure. And that is the key for every member's worry, that this House, when they're voting, that it is the person who they say we are. So we must look at that very seriously, and that will be completely checked before we do something that wouldn't be secure. Karen Bradley. Thank yeah. you very much, Mr Speaker. And uh, can I welcome some of the comments you have just made about uh, this being a, an iterative and evolving process. I think all of us would agree that there is no substitution 
for members being in the chamber and being able to hold the executive to account. We will all have seen as constituency MPs over the last few weeks an incredible both volume and complexity of casework, the like of which none of us have ever seen in this kind of uh, in, in this national emergency. And I know how much easier it would have been at times if I could have been in this place not just in the chamber and having the ability to question ministers and get an answer on the record, but also to see colleagues around the corridors, to meet them in the tea room, to have the ability to see them outside our offices while we're making a cup of tea, or whatever it is that we're doing at that time. That is the best way that parliamentarians who were elected by their constituents to represent their constituents in Westminster can deliver. And there is no doubt that what we will see over the next few days, weeks and possibly months will be a substitute for that, but it will be in no way able to, to compensate for the lack of spontaneity, the yeah. lack of ability to feed off each other, the efficiency. Of course, I will give way to my deputy chair on the procedure committee. I'm exceedingly grateful to the Right Honourable Lady for giving way. And on her point about something being temporary, I think it would be fair to say that within the Procedure Committee's various meetings over a number of weeks now, there has been uniformity across, across um, the committee that these really are temporary, short term, or any other description you wish to give for it. And we're hoping to come back to a fully functioning House as soon as, it, as, soon as health advice allows. I absolutely agree with my Deputy Chair. He is completely right to say that that point, and it was very clear during all of the committee meetings, which have all been conducted virtually over the last few weeks, but that all members felt very strongly that these measures must be strictly time limited. They reflect the situation the country finds itself in today. But we have developed our procedures and our way of doing business over 700 years since we last were unable to meet due to the Black Death, as the leader has spoken about. And, and it is evolving, and he, the leader is quite right to say procedure is the means to the end. This is not the means in itself. But that means has meant that the way we do our business is efficient, it is effective, and we are able to speak out for our constituents and, do, and make sure their voices are heard in this place. I want to put on record my uh, thanks and credit to everybody who's been involved in getting us to this point. This is no mean feat. When my committee first met, the committee was constituted on the 2nd of March, and at our very first meeting we said we need to look at procedures that might be required to deal with the coronavirus. And when it was first suggested we may have to block out seats in the chamber, uh, members were, were outraged. How could we possibly function if we weren't able to actually all come into this chamber and all contribute and be part of this? So it is, it is incredible to see the work that has been done in only a very short few weeks. And I agree with the leader when he says that our teams and our clerks and our staff as well, our parliamentary staff, expect that during recess they may have a little bit a free time to reflect the fact of how hard they work during the parliamentary uh, the time Parliament is sitting. Uh, that simply hasn't been the case uh, now. And I also want to thank you, Mr Speaker, for the pragmatic approach you have taken to this. I know that as Speaker of this House, you are the custodian of, of this House, this chamber and how we operate. And to, uh, to endorse something so radical as a change to our procedures as we are going to uh, vote on, and I hope not vote on, I hope agree on the voice today. <laughs> That is something that has taken great leadership from you, so I want to say thank you to you. Now, this is not going to be perfect. There are going to be glitches. There are going to be problems with this. We've all seen our internet go down. I have particular problems whenever a PlayStation is cranked up in the next door room, yeah. meaning that my ability to see what's going on in the, in the meetings I've been uh, conducting is not quite as easy as one would hope it would be. And we know that the lack of supplementaries, the lack of ability to come back in, the lack of the spontaneity, the knowing that you can only come in on a question if you have uh, been drawn out in a shuffle that you've applied for possibly days before, means that we're not going to be able to represent our constituents in the way that we would ideally want to do. But this is better than nothing. And the leader said quite rightly, we must not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We must understand that there will be glitches and this will evolve and it will change. And that over time, we will develop a way of, of, of working 
that gives us the best ability to represent our constituents. But I will repeat, it will never be a substitute for us being able to be here fully and fully part of the democratic process. I think that um, one point I do want to make to the leader is that the scrutiny of the emergency uh, uh, measures is absolutely vital. Uh, my right honourable friend um, made the point earlier that we have not had the chance to scrutinise the measures the government has introduced. There is a sunset on those. They do need to be scrutinised. I would urge the leader to ensure that they have uh, appropriate scrutiny at the earliest opportunity. Um, the Procedure Committee in its report that was issued this morning uh, endorses the changes that have been put forward, in particular the equality of treatment. It is absolutely vital that all members should be able to represent their constituents equally, whether they can get to the Chamber and choose to be here or not. Um, we do want to again repeat the temporary nature of these changes. These changes to procedure must be temporary, they must be time limited. I give way to my predecessor. Can I thank my right honourable friend for all the work she's done. I'd also like to thank her committee and its most excellent clerk, one of the most talented clerks in the House of Commons. Can I just say she's absolutely right in what she said earlier. The best way that I, and I'm sure she, can represent her constituents to the Chancellor and the Chief Financial Secretary well, the Chief Secretary is in person, and the quicker we are back here in person, being able to talk to the Chancellor, Cabinet Ministers and their other Ministers, the better it will be. Yeah. My honourable friend is absolutely right, and his extensive uh, uh, time leading the Procedure Committee, I know just the depth of knowledge that he uh, has in this area, but he's absolutely right. And, and whilst I do want to pay credit to Ministers for the accessibility that they, that they have given us as Members of Parliament to them through WhatsApp groups or telephone calls or, or, or messages that they've sent us, it, it has been unprecedented to have had the level of contact that Members have been able to have remotely, but it is no substitution for actually being here and being able able to ask a question in public that constituents can see us asking and that they can hear the answer of so that they know what the government is intending to do with the questions and the concerns that they have. Um, I'm very grateful, Mr Speaker, for your comments on points of order. My committee were concerned about whether there would be a way of ensuring that we could make sure proceedings were orderly, so I'm grateful that you are looking at that. I do want to turn to concerns around voting. Um, my committee approved a report yesterday which was issued this morning on the basis that we were not looking at reforms to the way that this place conducts votes. Now I well understand that there will need to be changes to the voting uh, uh, procedures for next week to ensure that business is not lost. We have to make sure that in, in the event of some sort of uh, misunderstanding or something not quite working, that the government does not lose the important business that it wishes to bring forward next week. But I would say to the leader that to bring forward motions tomorrow on further changes to voting will give concern to my committee. My committee hasn't looked in thoroughly at what is proposed with regards to remote voting. Some of us have tried the uh, trial run of it and can't say it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, a lot more work will need, need to be done and I know how hard the teams are working on this. This is no criticism of anybody but I would just ask him to consider whether there could be a staged process in introducing motions relating to remote voting because he needs to take the House with him. The House is here today to support him because we want all our colleagues to be part of this debate. We want all our colleagues to be able to contribute. Um, but he needs to take the House with him on this. And on that basis, Mr Speaker, the Procedure Committee does endorse the, uh, motion that's been put, the motions that have been put forward today and urges the, uh, the House to approve them without the need for a division. John Spellard. Uh, thank you, Mr. S Mr. S Mr. Speaker, and really echoing the point from the uh, chair of the uh, Procedure Committee that these uh, measures are not desirable, but they are absolutely, absolutely necessary. But they are also, also they are suboptimal because we often use phrases here which I think sometimes we all understand, but we ought to phrase them in the way that the public would understand. We talk about holding the government to account. We talk about scrutiny. Basically, that means asking questions. 
It means asking the questions that occur to us out of, our, out of our knowledge and experience and also out of the knowledge and experience of our constituents. And we have been getting a very considerable number of questions. I'll come on to a few of those later on during the, during the course of this crisis. And those questions need, need answering, and they need answering in this chamber, which actually, which actually has to be the epicentre of the dem democratic system, as the uh, Leader of the House was saying, in this country. Otherwise, what is the point of, of, of Parliament? Now, in those questions, I do not expect departments or ministers to get everything right. I, uh, full, I, I absolutely expect mistakes to be made. In fact, if mistakes were not being made, I would be really alarmed because if, pro if things are not going, sometimes going wrong, it means decisions aren't being taken. And some decisions will go wrong. Test of government, test of a, of a minister, test even of a business is how quickly you identify those problems and how quickly that they are going to be, going to be remedied. Now, many of those questions, I would argue, should be being asked inside government. And I do have some concerns on uh, look, examining, looking at how things are panning out, that sometimes these questions are not being asked either within departments or, be or, or, or between departments. There does seem to be a degree of dysfunctionality, dysfunctionality then. I don't think press conferences are really getting to the heart of the issues either. I think it is here particularly, and I fully understand the constraints that you and the House are operating under, uh, Mr Speaker, but if we can't have supplementaries, and I think that should be part of e the evolution, then when it becomes clear that ministers, quite frankly, sometimes see this in press conferences, are talking in repetitive clichés, when we actually need answers. And even if a minister says, I don't know, or we're looking at that again because we're not sure that, work, that worked out properly. That's the way in which we are going to make progress and be able to assess when this is failing and also to put the, uh, put the pressure, pressure, pressure on. See, for example, last, uh, last month I, we had both the Foreign Secretary and then the Prime Minister. And I was able to ask both of them on successive days, I'm pleased to say, about this very serious situation of very large numbers of our people stranded in uh, India and Pakistan and, 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 and ba Bangladesh. And I'm still concerned, by the way, at the long delay in getting them back compared with many other, uh, many other countries, particularly, for example, Germany, who have managed to bring back tens of thousands. But we were able then to put some pressure onto the system and get some, some, some reaction by that direct, that direct confrontation. It's not the same as just writing a, uh, as writing a letter or in a slightly sterile chamber, although that will be an improvement. In the same way, many members of Parliament are having complaints both from hospitals, care homes, but also from manufacturers and distributors about PPE. Somewhere in the system, this is not matching up, but it doesn't seem to be getting through in the system as to how you can manage to pull those together. And therefore, some pressure here would actually put that energy through the system. Those of us who have been ministers know if a minister has a hard time here in the chamber, when they get back to the department, I see nods from those who have been ministers, get back to the department, they say, why did you leave me out there in open country? I want some answers and I want them by the after. So on that point. Would my right hon. Friend agree with me that in these strange and difficult times, perhaps the usual order of departmental questions should be changed so we get more chances to ask questions of the Treasury and the Department of Health, two departments absolutely in the front line of this crisis? I hope that that suggestion may have been taken on board by those who are, those who are dealing with this, or maybe for certain departments and extended period of questions, rather than greater frequency, maybe, maybe an, ex an, ex an extended period, or some system, a, a more open system in which written questions can go in and be answered in real time in order to get a, uh, to get a response. I think we have to be flexible, flexible on that, 
but we do need to be able to put those points and to try and get a response. Um, if, it's, if it's helpful to him, I think it's fair to say in the Procedure Committee we have looked at, at written day questions and name day questions, and we will review it. And we've agreed to that just yesterday. So to reassure him, it's very much in the committee's prism of work as well. Uh, I can thank my honourable, uh, my honourable fr friend and ranking minority member of the Procedure Committee for that uh, for that, reassur that reassur reassurance on that. And there are many other is issues which will be familiar to colleagues on all sides around the chamber about nursery uh, about nursery education, both providers and and, and parents, lorry dr lo lorry drivers, and their ability actually to get a hot meal on the uh, on the motor end. Why aren't the transport department insisting? That those franchisees on the on the motorway are actually opening up for lorry drivers to make sure that they are fed, performing the vital uh, service of keeping this this country country going. We've already talked about the problems of flights, furlough arrangements, company access to to, uh, to to support. Those are all issues which I think have to be resolved resolved here, and we need therefore to make sure that as far as possible we can replicate the arrangement so that ministers have to be up there answering. I hope ministers will be coming to the chamber in order, in order to do that, in order that we can make progress and, Im and improve things. Finally, the Leader of the House says he, thinks this, um, he hopes and intends that these should be temporary. But in the end, of course, some, for some, this may suit it, them for it not to be temporary. Already had a member of, member, of, member of Parliament from the SNP saying, well, why do people anyway have to come down here to one point from all four parts of the country in order to participate yeah, in, in, in the business of the, of, the, of the House? Many in the civil service and government are quite happy if Parliament is less effective in actually holding them, holding them to, uh, to, to, ac to account. Some, I would say, also maybe get the balance a bit wrong between working, hard, working for their constituents, which is a hugely and important and essential part of the job, but it may be they get the balance wrong with that, and actually, being, actually running the country and, and actually asking those questions here in Parliament. Well, thank, I thank the Right Honourable Gentleman for giving way, and he's making some very powerful points. Can I just also make the point that actually scrutiny in this place gives ministers a chance to explain things? It gives them the chance to set out the, the, what they're doing. They shouldn't run away from it or be scared of it, because this is their chance to set out the good news and the good work that the government is doing. And that's why we need to have scrutiny here, so we can have that full explanation from government ministers, so we can hold them to account when they do get things wrong, but that we can hear from them when they get things right. I thank the chair, chair of the Procedure Committee and actually, actually and, uh, and very generally congratulate her on the work that she's doing already in that, in, in that position. She's absolutely right. And it reminds me of the uh, statement of Warren Buffett about financial crises. When the tide goes out, you can see who's been bathing without trunks. And, uh, and reputation, <laughs> reputations get, get made and lost very quickly in crises. And she's absolutely right. Those ministers who are doing a good job and have a robust defence and can even say, look, yeah, we tried that, we did it on, uh, on, for reasonable grounds, but, but that didn't work out, and this is what we're doing. They are the ones whose reputations will thrive. And those who try and run away from scrutiny and run away from decisions, their reputa reputations will sink. However, what we also need is, some time, is some, not necessarily a timetable, but certainly a, set, a statement of the necessary conditions for returning to normality. And uh, I, I recognise and I'm pleased to see that there is a, uh, a, a date within the legislation, but that will presumably, and understandably, I'm not criticising that, also be subject to renewal. But I think we really need to have a clearer idea of what will be the necessary conditions that will enable us to come out of this. Because otherwise there will always be the tendency for some of those groups that I've described previously to always find reasons for just continuing with the, with the status quo, rather than getting this House, of Par this House of Parliament back to its position at the heart of the debate and the political life of this nation. So Desmond Sway. Uh, the problem is number six, Mr Speaker. The, uh, the enabling of uh, your own office to exclude members uh, from the chamber when we are too many. Uh, that might make you very popular with those who are allowed in, uh, but very unpopular 
with those of us who might be excluded. And I think it's very, very um, uh, unpleasant to put you in that very difficult situation. I know that this only applies for the periods of scrutiny, but where I'm looking for reassurance from the Leader of the House is when it comes to debate and how we take forward legislation, because this is the precedent that we're now setting. And it would be outrageous if members elected to this House were unable to come and bring their concerns to this chamber because there were already a sufficient number of members within it. When we come to debate, which I hope we shall, the extraordinary regulations that have been imposed on our citizens and all the anomalies and indeed absurdities that are in them, let alone when we get to debate the question of when we lift those regulations, just let's come to the debate on the actual imposition of those regulations. So I'm looking for some reassurance that when we come to consider the procedures that will apply as we take forward these matters, we will not have members properly elected by the constituents being excluded from this chamber. Impit. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. At the outset, can I commend you, sir, for your leadership at this time? Can I commend your staff, uh, the clerks of the House and the business leaders and those in the committee who uh, have worked very, very hard under very, very difficult circumstances to try and allow our Parliament to function and to make sure that it is able to function. And for that, sir, you should be commended and praised. Um, I, I think it is important, as other members have rightly said across this House, that we must emphasise that this is a temporary measure. I remember in Northern Ireland there were temporary powers. They lasted for over 20 years. That would be a disgrace if that were to happen. I think we all agree on that, that we must ensure, as all members have rightly emphasised, the temporary nature, hopefully for a matter of weeks and weeks only, that we'll be in this position. It would be rank hypocrisy if we were to expect our constituents to go to work and we ourselves decided to protect ourselves. We have a duty to be here. We have a responsibility to hold government to account, and we must do that and make sure that we, as well as that, give our people and our country a vision that we will get out of this dark tunnel, that there is light at the end of the tunnel, and that things will go back, probably to a different normality, but that things will return, and that we will get our country functioning and working again and moving in the right direction. And if ever something has brought our country together, it probably has been this crisis and not previous crises that have entitled us and ensured that we are doing what is best and putting a best foot forward and making sure that the right leadership is seen. I started my comments with the view, sir, of congratulating you for your leadership. It's important that members demonstrate leadership, therefore, in the community, and that government demonstrates leadership by providing that vision, by indeed, as the honourable, my right honourable friend has said, um, provides us with a timetable and a timeline of when they expect, will well, not be rock, uh, held fast by it, but a timeline is when we can expect to see movement, as other countries have done. The Republic of Ireland has indicated when it intends to move, France has indicated when it intends to move, Germany has indicated its intention, of course, the United States has indicated its intentions. We should be in a position to at least give people some signposts of when progress will happen and when there will be better days ahead for our entire community. It would be remiss not to express for a few moments our sadness at the great number of bereaved across our entire nation. This has affected practically every community, every household, and uh, it is something which I think uh, draws us very, very closer to the reality that you know, uh, we are just temporary dwellings here and uh, that the uh, shock of what has happened is palpable for all to see. And I think that's probably led to the very, very good and strong behaviour by the vast number of our citizens to follow the guidance, to rely on the expert advice, to rely on the messages that government is putting out, and uh, has also ensured that we're not being party political about what has happened. And I think we need to commend those people. But our thoughts and prayers are, of course, with the brave, with those who have had to bury their loved ones alone, those who have not been able to say goodbye, those who uh, are 
deeply hurt and saddened by what has happened. And uh, I'm, I'm glad uh, that some of the numbers have not been exceeded. We originally had an expectation of seeing 15,000 people um, in Northern Ireland come to this. Thankfully, it's less than a few hundred now. Uh, we hope that that uh, will remain the case, but we're by no means out of the woods, and we have to make sure that we do see progress, and we encourage our great academics and our great scientists and our, uh, our great chemists to come up with something that will help us get out of this. When I was a child, I had to learn the shorter catechism, and its first question was, what is man's chief end? It is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. As a member of parliament, if there was a catechism, it would be to hold the government to account uh, that is our chief end as members of this House, to make sure that we are a voice for our voiceless community and that we get the opportunity to say in this House the things that need to be said by the people who have sent us here to be their voice. Yeah, yeah. It is absolutely essential that no member, because of a lack of technical skill, because of a lack of broadband and where they are living in their constituency, that no member is penalised whatsoever in their ability to make a contribution to this House on behalf of their citizens that they represent. It's absolutely essential that we have that role. And these measures fall well short of holding government to account. I think everyone recognises that. They are prepared, I think, to give them a bye-ball because of the temporary nature of what is happening here. But it is absolutely crucial that uh, we recognise that we get out of this emergency procedure as quickly as possible. There are many issues that we need to hold the government to account. Members have rhymed some of them off. Um, issues to do with dentists in my own constituency and across this nation. Issues to do with our farming community and the production of food and the ability to get to markets uh, and make their, their, their product um, available to the general public, our NHS staff and their PPE uh, and their access or lack thereof, uh, the, the, those who fall between the regulations that our Chancellor has put forward, um, they, they cause us great concern that they are left out and will have nothing in all of this and are left hopeless. And of course, we do need to scrutinise what the banks have done, been doing. They've been given a responsibility to do certain things, and some of them have not come up to, to the mark. We have not had the opportunity to hold them to account, and we have a responsibility to do that. And so, I, in closing, Mr. Speaker, I do recognise the importance of these measures. We accept we're in very, very difficult times, but we give our people hope that we, there will be better times ahead. We will get out of this. We will be a stronger and better place for doing it. But we must ensure that this is a short and temporary measure. No point. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I associate myself with many of the comments made by the honourable member for North Antrim? Uh, I won't repeat them today. But I would say this: the very nature of the public health emergency that has made it necessary to introduce these changes is, in its, is itself the very reason why we have to have maximal accountability and flexibility in an ever-changing picture. We have to have, as elected members of parliament, the ability to raise emerging issues and to raise emergency issues. Now, we all know that from experience that the gap between tabling a written question and having it answered can actually make the question out of date by the time it actually gets to a minister being on their feet. And let's be very frank, those who have been ministers know that there is no fear whatsoever at the dispatch box from answering the prepared question that has already been set down. The only thing that brings any fear to ministers is the unknown supplementary that will come and will be the genuinely probing question that will seek the information not set out in the civil service written reply that most ministers will have. Therefore, the ability to be able to have some sort of supplementary is the key probing element of what we have in questions to departments in this House. Now, Mr Speaker, I think that in the current situation where there will be a great desire to be probing uh, for economic reasons, the Treasury ministers and for the uh, health ministers also, that, can, that does not need us to have changes to questions. What it does require is for the government to be willing uh, to come forward with regular statements on these issues so that the House can use this alternative mechanism, one which I think is inherently more flexible rather than the written parliamentary question system. It also, I think, requires the, the responsible use 
of urgent questions, so that they are not flippant and time-consuming, not that, Mr Speaker, you would allow either of those <laughs> to take place. But we do need to exercise, I think, particular personal responsibility in the issues and how we use what will be limited time in the House. And that also applies to the government. We need to have minimal legislation. Some of us think we should have minimal legislation anyway, and that the less time we spend making more laws for our country, the better. But the government should certainly at this time be bringing minimal legislation, only that which is absolutely essential to the conduct of government to the House of Commons for however long these restrictions exist. And I would say, in echo of what others have said, the continuity of this parliament in as normal a form as we can possibly make it, given all the restrictions, is essential for we have a leadership role as members of this House in our country to behave as normally as we possibly can in the circumstances. And it's not just that we give an example to people in our own country about the exercise of democracy. It's also very important in this country that we, who have pride ourselves on our democratic tradition, show that democracy will be resilient in whatever circumstances, particularly to those parts of the world who do not benefit from representative parliamentary democracy in that we do. We should always be willing as a parliament to fly the flag for that democratic principle. Yeah. Jim Shannon. Yeah, Mr Speaker, and, and, and uh, just want to say, Mr Speaker, that uh, I, I uh, uh, very much love the ritual and the tradition and the history of this House, as many others do. I may not always adhere to the ritual in the way that uh, Mr Speaker or others would like us to, or like me to in particular, but I do my best to, to follow the rules and regulations. I love that tradition, I love that history and I love that ritual. So what we have today in front of me personally, Mr Speaker, is something that uh, I feel perhaps a wee bit alien to the process of this House and, and, and how we have done business, in, in my case, in the last uh, approximately t 10 years here, and with my colleague for, for uh, uh, Northampton as well. But uh, the Leader of the House referred to, to being a traditionist. I'm very much a traditionist as well. Uh, I'm not uh, against change. And Mr. Speaker, I know that uh, the Leader of the House referred to yourself as a, a traditionist as well. Uh, uh, I can't say if you are or not. You'll make that own decision. But I perceive that you are a traditionist, the same as many others are in this House. And, and the need for this ritual is very, very important. Uh, I want to ask the question uh, uh, to the Leader of the House in relation to the question I, 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 submit, I asked him earlier on. Uh, about the, the abortion, uh, 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 potential abortion uh, legislation that may come here. I understand, Mr Speaker, that the, 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 the legislation as such proposed in this place will come before a delegated legislative committee. Uh, and I want to ask the question, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, how, how can we, uh, as members of this House who may not be on that delegated legislative committee, have a participation <clears throat> in, in that committee, whenever that information and legislation and possibility uh, potential legislation can be brought before this House, I understand the procedure at this moment in time, Mr. Speaker, is that we can uh, um, uh, uh, be attend the, the delegated legislative committee, that we can ask for permission to address that committee, although we cannot ever be part of that voting process but of, of how it's done. So I just want to check, uh, first of all, procedurally, how, how we can do that and can we continue to do that. I also want to uh, uh, underline the point, uh, and, and I, I say this in, uh, uh, with, with all humbleness, uh, 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 Mr Speaker, I, I, I'm not technically minded. Um, I'm, 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 I've, I've, I've just learned how to text uh, about two years ago. Um, I, I'm, I'm being honest, Mr Speaker, uh, and, and I want to be honest because uh, I, I want to ensure that the, that, that um, that participation for myself and, and perhaps others in this House who, who may not have had the opportunity to express themselves in the way that I have today, uh, to ensure that we um, can be part of that voting process. I asked the Leader of the House, I know that he and I uh, very, much share, very much share a certain uh, belief in, 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 in on the issues of moral issues and, uh, and religious issues, uh, and, and we share those uh, with a deep, deep heartfelt uh, uh, belief. And I want to make sure that, that, that uh, those of us who will perhaps not be sure of how the IT works, how, they, how they, they, the system may work, I know I have staff, of course, and I'm very conscious, Mr Speaker, that we're also staff are working uh, from their own homes, so a staff member will come in and perhaps set it up, and there may be some help from IT, of course, to do that as well. And I understand. Uh, absolutely, yes, I am. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. He is 
probably the most assiduous member of this house and attends this chamber every day. And so I wonder if he shares my disquiet about this very big decision to downgrade the importance of being physically present uh, as part of our proceedings with a debate which is pretty brief, which hasn't had notice. Um, I think we recognise the importance of making these changes, but will he agree with me it's vital that they are just temporary and they don't become permanent without much more thought, much more extensive and, and uh, uh, debate on these matters? I, I, I thank the Honourable Lady for our intervention. Yes, I, I do share those concerns. And the process for me, Mr Speaker, uh, as the Honourable Lady has outlined, is to be in this House and participating in the debates as put forward on, on behalf of my constituents uh, and, 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 and from Strangford and indeed across the whole of the United Kingdom. Because we're making decisions here for, for the whole of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and not just for Northern Ireland uh, alone. I, I, I do think, Mr Speaker, that uh, the reason why the scrutiny is really important in this House is because when we look forward to the future, um, and, and we have to have that exit strategy. Uh, I know I'm, I'm not for one second am I saying that, 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 that the, the ministers and government and the prime minister um, have not got an exit strategy in mind, but I think it's so important that our people have have some idea of that vision of where we're going and, and, and a time scale, providing everything that goes according to plan. Uh, it's, so we can perhaps uh, uh, look at how shops can open again. For, for instance, hardware shops are able to open, uh, garden centres aren't. Uh, some people might say, uh, I'm one of them, by the way, Mr. Speaker, who would say that if hardware stores can operate in the self distancing process that they can back home, where you phone up the place, you make your order, you then arrive down, you stay in your car, somebody comes out and, and, and leaves it for you, he leaves, and then you pick it up and put it in your car and take it away. Why can't that process not be the same process? For garden centres, again, that's something when it comes to scrutiny in this house. We should perhaps have, have the opportunity to do uh, for funerals. Uh, we understand the the, the um, sadness, Mr. Speaker, there are for those people who, who have funerals. Uh, um, I, I've had a couple of Michael Sydney's who have passed away, and I'm very, very conscious uh, that both those funerals that only ten people could attend, uh, and, and that meant that some family members were precluded. I understand the process. I'm not being critical of, of how it was done. I'm just saying. Is it not possible in this process of scrutiny that we have, Mr Speaker, that, that the self-distancing process could have meant more people could attend the funerals? Not only bride from my church day, uh, only 10 people could attend. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, that was an immensely frustrating for many people who wished to, to express themselves, but the opportunity to do that will come again. But I just want to ensure that we um, can have the opportunity, Mr Speaker, to ask the questions in this House uh, or through the new process of, of, of the virtual parliament, uh, and that we can and, and enable our constituents to have a voice in this chamber, or whatever that process that will be, ever mindful as Honourable Lady referred, it's only for a short time, and it's only for a short time is why I understand the need for <laughs> Mr Speaker, who would ever have thought uh, that we would be in the position we're in today? Not there been nobody, no, not myself in, in, in particular, would never have predicted uh, uh, that things would be as they are. I, I just want to say as well, we need to scrutinise. We need to have a, 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 an opportunity to ask the questions for. for our, I, I've already emailed and written off to, to, to the Minister for, for, for Agriculture, uh, for DEFRA, uh, on the issue. And Mr Speaker, I know what I'm going to say is exactly what you're thinking. Uh, and, and it's, about, uh, it's about the beef cattle that's down £185 a beast. It's about lambs that are down forty pound, forty pound each. It's about milk dropping from 25, 28 and a half litres down to twenty three and a half litres, with a possibility of falling to eighteen. Those are critical, crucial issues for us in this house to ask with scrutiny. Uh, and, 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 and we can't answer this question, as honourable gentleman referred to, in three weeks' time. We need the answer today, uh, and that's the point uh, when it comes to scrutiny in this house and how we move forward. Um, and also, uh, I conclude with this, Mr. Speaker, and I'm not going to go on much longer on this. Just to say this: that we also need contact, and I'm sure I, I know it's happening. But it's really important that we have all the four regions of the United Kingdom, of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, that are working together. So when we move forward with the, with the questions that come up regionally, with the issues that that we that we all have, that we have a strategy, we can move us forward. I think it was Captain Tom Moore, who we all know and 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 uh, have uh, much enjoyed. They, who raised through that social giving uh, some £25.5 million, 
And he said, tomorrow will be a better day. Let's hope for that. Leader of the House. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. And with the leave of the House, if I may try and respond to some of the points that were made. Um, the Right Honourable Lady, um, the, the Shadow Leader, asked if the time limit can be expanded. We are currently working with what we think is the maximum that can be done with the technology, but very much the hope is that it can be expanded. And you, Mr Speaker, responded to the point on secure voting. Any remote voting must be secure. We don't want other people to be voting uh, other than members. Uh, yes, of course. I'm, I'm exceedingly grateful to the leader for giving way. Just, I agree with him, obviously, that it needs to be secure, but also can he provide some reassurance that when testing for voting is done, that it is actually has enough capacity to, in, to allow all 650 members to be able to vote remotely? Because my understanding is on testing yesterday, it didn't go terribly well, is how it's been described to me. Um, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right that um, any system needs to work and to be robust uh, and to ensure that votes are, are properly uh, registered. Um, on points of order uh, which came up both from the Right Honourable Lady and from the Honourable Gentleman, I believe those can be sent to you, Mr Speaker, in written form. So it's not as if there won't be any ability to raise points. It simply won't be possible to interrupt a television screen uh, because that wouldn't actually work. Um, if I could reiterate my thanks to my right honourable friend, uh, the member for Staffordshire Moorlands and chairman of the Procedure Committee. Uh, like her, I think all MPs have seen an enormous explosion of casework, and therefore having the ability to hold ministers to account and get answers uh, for one's constituents is very important. Uh, my right honourable friend, like a number uh, of other members, um, the right honourable gentleman, the member for Worley, um, my right honourable friend, the member for North Somerset, um, my right honourable friend, the member for Chipping Barnet, and the honourable member for Strangford, all emphasised the importance of this being temporary. I would not have put my name to these motions if it were not going to be temporary. I want Parliament to be back operating properly in its normal way. But as the honourable gentleman, the member for North Antrim, pointed out, this is actually about people dying. And what we are doing is part of trying to save lives along with the rest of the country. And yes, it is second best. Yes, it is imperfect that we should meet with those screens and with the chamber losing its um, normal uh, decoration in the way that it has. But we are doing our best in very difficult circumstances to maintain as much as we can. It goes on the 12th of May. It may have to be renewed at that point. But the motions are temporary and will remain uh, temporary. Um, I agree with the right honourable gentleman, the member from Morley, that this is much better than press conferences. Holding the government to account makes for better government. And it may not be that this is a common view expressed at the dispatch box, but it wasn't that long ago that I was a backbencher. And that as a backbencher, you see week in, week out, year in, year out, how better decisions are taken because the government is held to account. And I think wise governments, and inevitably I think this government is a wise government, actually have the sense to recognise that. Um, my right hon. Friend, the member for New Forest West, made an extraordinarily important point fundamental constitutional point that a member who wishes to represent his or her constituents must be able to do so. And that is part of what we are trying to do. Now, how this is managed with a matter at maximum of 50 in the chamber is a matter for Mr Speaker. But the purpose of that is that we maintain safe social distancing, but that if a member needs to get in and is on the list to be called to speak, if I am in the chamber, I will leave to make way for that member to come in and speak. I will go and watch it in my room on the television if I'm answering the debate so that the member may come in and make the point. We will have to work with each other to maintain our ancient constitutional rights. And I would point out, Mr Speaker, you know it's one of my favourite points, we have all had a right of uninterrupted, um, unhindered access to Parliament since 1340. It is one of our most ancient and most precious rights, uh, and I can assure my right honourable friend that I'm not the person who wants to be leader of the House when that right is taken away, but it may be operated differently to ensure that it works uh, with safeguarding. Um, I'm very grateful for the widespread support for these motions. We are all trying to do 
are best in difficult circumstances, and I think the House has appreciated that. And I'm very grateful, I ought to add, to the Opposition Chief Whip, who has worked very closely uh, with the Government Chief Whip and, indeed, representatives of the SNP to ensure that these um, proposals could be agreed. The question is the motion on proceedings during the pandemic. As many are of that opinion say aye. Aye. The country no. I think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. I call the Leader of the House to move the second motion formally. The question is the motion on hybrid scrutiny proceedings. As many are of that opinion say aye. Aye. The country no. I think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. I am grateful to the House for the manner in which it has conducted this debate. To all those who have worked so hard to establish the arrangements which will apply from tomorrow and to the Procedure Committee for the High Speed Report. Guidance for members on arrangements is now available online and a hard copy from the Vote Office. I should also alert members that the deadline for urgent questions to be taken on Tuesdays and Wednesdays will be 1 pm, not 2 pm, as stated in the explanatory memorandum. Order. I have received a letter from the Honourable Member for Leeds West, resigning as the Chair of the Business, Energy, Industrial Strategy Committee. I have also received a letter from the Honourable Member for Stretford and Urmston, announcing her intention to resign as Chair of the Committee on Standards when her successor has been elected. I wish to pay tribute to the commitment and the dedication which both of them have chaired their respective committees, both in the present Parliament and in the last. I will make an announcement about the arrangements for elections tomorrow. I understand that the 10 minute rule motion will not be moved. Business statement. Mr. Statement. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I should like to make a business statement. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, you have announced new arrangements for all questions, urgent questions, and statements in this House during the coming weeks. And with this in mind, the arrangement of other, um, with the agreement of other parties, it is the government's intention to prioritise its legislative requirements to allow for minimum attendance uh, in this chamber. I can confirm today that the House will not proceed with the second reading of the Immigration and Social Security Coordination EU Withdrawal Bill. Tomorrow, Wednesday, the 22nd of April, the House will, for the first time, be able to question ministers remotely. Prime Minister's questions and any urgent questions or statements will be followed by procedural motions. On Monday, the 27th of April, this House will return for the second reading of the Finance Bill. On Tuesday, the 28th of April, the House will consider the second reading of the Domestic Abuse Bill. And on Wednesday, the 29th of April, the House will consider the second reading of the Fire Safety Bill. We are living in uncertain times, and as a consequence of the situation that we are in, the business that I have announced will be subject to continuous review and possible change. I will, of course, update the House as required. Where do I start? <laughs> Let's work along. William Bragg. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Look, I'm too busy standing. Shadow Leader of the House. I'll revise. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm still here. Um, can I uh, thank the uh, virtually and physically? <laughs> I thank the Leader of the House for the uh, emergency business statement. And can, can I start by, because we haven't had the opportunity before, to remember the uh, dead and the grieving families. Uh, their lives are utterly changed and they'll never be the same again. I also want to mention, because we do live in extraordinary times, we have had a Prime Minister who's been in intensive care and other members of this House have been extremely ill. Uh, and I want to wish them all a speedy recovery and to remember them. Um, also, to all the frontline staff, the NHS, and all those involved in public service, and everyone from the House authorities for getting us to this point. You did, the leader did say that we would be returning on the 21st, and despite this extraordinary circumstance, we are here debating in the House of Commons in the chamber on the 21st of April, uh, and we have returned uh, to do the democratic process and to hold the government account, which of course we want to do. Um, the opposition have come out of lockdown and there was red smoke and I'm pleased to say and I'd like to congratulate the new leader of the opposition, the right honourable member for Hoban and St Pancras yeah. and the honourable lady from Ashton under line. Uh, we have a new front bench team who are working incredibly hard and we do want to work in a constructive way to protect people and the economy. 
And it is right that we learn from other countries, Mr Speaker, and that we start looking at an exit strategy to plan in advance so that options can be explored and strategies tested for when we do come out on the other side and make sure all our folks don't suffer. Um, I appreciate this is not static, it's going to change, and I want to also pay tribute because I know how hard uh, the, uh, my Chief Whip and, and uh, the uh, Government Chief Whip have worked in ensuring that we get to this place, and we know that the usual channels will have to work continually to ensure that business comes before this House. Um, things won't be static. I had understood that, and the leader, but the leader hasn't announced there will be a statement on coronavirus tomorrow. I hope he can confirm that. What we're looking for, Mr Speaker, are answers, proper answers, like we get the graphs at the press conferences. We want to know how many ventilators there are, whether there is PPE. We don't, you know, the leader of that, we already know that there has been difficulty in pinning down when exactly the PPE is coming from Turkey, and that shouldn't be the case. We need to know that it's going to arrive when the shipment will be here. We do want to work in a constructive way, and our constituents will uh, tell us, because we know they've been stranded, as the Honourable Member for Worley has said, they've been stranded. But when they tell us that they've come through, they said Heathrow Airport is acting in a completely different way to other airports. There are no checks. There is no hand sanitizers, no masks, nothing. People just walk straight through. So it's right that we have to raise these issues, and we will continue to raise them. And I want to place on record my thanks to the Acting High Commissioner in India, Jan Thompson, who's been absolutely fantastic in getting our constituents back. He knows I'm going to raise our British citizens, Nazanin, Anushe, and Kylie, British citizens that we want to be responsible for. They need to be back home in this difficult time. But with another death of a BAME consultant, Manjeet Singh Rayat, 52 years old, who died in his own hospital, could I ask the Leader of the House to provide a written statement on the terms of reference on the inquiry that the Government has announced into the over-representation of deaths among the BAME community, not only on the healthcare professionals, but also ordinary citizens. And finally, I want to wish our gracious Sovereign a very happy birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Of the House. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The Right Honourable Lady is so right to mention at the beginning of her statement the dead and the grieving, uh, and that we must pray for the souls of the dead and for the comfort of those who grieve and for those who are suffering in the hope that they recover. And I think the, all of us have known people who have been very seriously ill, um, and the recovery of those who have been ill is something that is worth praying for. And may I join her in congratulating the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Hoban and St Pancras, in his uh, election. Um, I'm one of those people who always thinks that an effective opposition leads to better government, so I, in a roundabout way, wish him extraordinarily well, because I think it's in the interests of the country uh, to have an effective opposition. Uh, and I also congratulate uh, the Honourable Lady, the Member for ashton under Lyme, uh, in winning the Deputy uh, Leadership. But I'm particularly pleased, if I may say so, Mr Speaker, that the Right Honourable Lady remained in her post in the reshuffle, uh, and, and um, I, I hope that we can carry on uh, debating as, as we have been. And I'm grateful for her support in this difficult time and for the support of the opposition in being very constructive in most of its um, suggestions. Uh, I too believe there will be a statement by the Health Secretary uh, tomorrow, the um, first virtual statement, um, and that I'm sure he will, as always, give proper answers. I don't think she needs to worry uh, about um, his answers being anything other than proper and complete. And it is right that issues are raised in this House uh, in that way. Um, as always, she raises the issue of Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe, who has been temporarily released, as she knows, and the Government hopes that that release will be made permanent and continues to make the case for British citizens who are detained improperly. I, I note her request for the terms of reference for the inquiry into the disproportionate number of deaths among the BME community, and I will take that up for her and give her a written answer. And I got in first on wishing Her Majesty a happy birthday. But um, I'm always happy to do it. And isn't it wonderful that we can carry on singing the national anthem, washing our hands, and we will do that today with a special spring in our step. <laughs> William Rack. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I begin by expressing my condolences 
uh, to families of constituents who have sadly lost their lives to COVID-19 and pay particular tribute to the nurses and doctors at Stepping Hill Hospital and those working in social care throughout my constituency for their extraordinary efforts. And in that light, could I ask uh, the Leader of the House if he uh, could convey the message that it may be appropriate for the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster to make a statement tomorrow upon the PPE procurement processes, because I'm sure that we're all finding in our own ways with the inquiries from businesses and healthcare settings that there is certainly a, a blockage in the system. Mr Speaker, I would have tabled an urgent question on the matter today, but it would be an invidious a decision for you to have made, given many members have not been present and our proceedings have not yet adopted, but its urgency is absolutely vital. Leader of the House. Uh, um, uh, Mr Speaker, um, uh, thank you. Um, the question of a statement tomorrow I have already mentioned, and it will be the Health Secretary, I believe, who will be making the statement tomorrow. The issue around PPP procurement is an important one. It is worth bearing in mind that over a billion pieces of PPE have been distributed. Uh, and yes, of course, there is more that needs to be done, but I am sure that will be covered by the Health Secretary tomorrow. Jim Shannon. Mr Speaker. Uh, Leader of the House, ever mindful of the business that we had before the coronavirus outbreak came in uh, and the process, uh, uh, I just asked the question, Mr Speaker, uh, will that business in relation to, to Westminster Hall, businesses, uh, business in this chamber, which was uh, uh, lined up for Thursday this week, which will probably not take place, uh, will, will that resume exactly whenever, whenever the, the, the process comes to an end uh, of the coronavirus? Very conscious that there's lots of business that individual members, as others have said in this house, wish to bring forward, wish to be considered for this house, and, and when normality resumes, just want to seek uh, uh, um, uh, guidance from the leader of the house that that process will happen whenever normality returns, as God willing, it will. Leader of the house, uh, Mr. Speaker, the motions that are being put down for tomorrow allow for an extension of the list of things that may be debated. And that will depend on how long we are in this situation. The longer we are in it for, the more items will be able to be taken. On the other hand, the hope must be that we come out of this and then can resu resume normal practice. At that point, what is brought forward will be a matter for the Backbench Business Committee and for Mr Speaker and for the other processes that lead to business being decided. I'll work my way along. Theresa Villiers. Uh, Mr Speaker. Um, can, can the Leader of the House give us a debate on how and when we come out of the lockdown? I understand Minister's caution about talking about this issue, but this is a country which is committed to saving lives by staying at home. It's committed to the lockdown. That commitment will be unshaken by a transparent debate on how the lockdown is gradually brought to an end. We need hope. We need hope for businesses on the edge, and we will get hope if we have a debate on how and when the lockdown comes to an end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the house. The, the, my right honourable friend is right to raise this, and that is, of course, part of bringing this House back into a functioning state and having a virtual parliament. It will allow tomorrow for the First Secretary of State to be questioned, and I am sure he will be questioned on these issues, and likewise the Health Secretary. And then next week, with questions and statements, this process will be able to continue. And it is right that these questions should be raised in this chamber. Ian Pace. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, can the uh, Business uh, Leader of the House uh, indicate to us when the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland will uh, be able to take questions and make a statement about the impact of COVID-19 in Northern Ireland, and the, uh, uh, when could we have a debate uh, specifically that would allow us to address the issues that have specifically impacted on our province? Could he also indicate to us, in line with other questions that have been asked, that there will be no attempt to usurp the powers of the Northern Ireland Assembly now that devolution is up and running again on any matter, and of course, most importantly, in those matters to do with the life of the unborn child. And finally, um, would the business leader of the House of the House consider at the end of all of this, and we will know how um, people in Northern Ireland love to march and love to celebrate, but at the end of all of this, could we have a march for our health workers across the United Kingdom, a march for health to encourage them to thank them in a very public way, more than just what the round of applause has done every Thursday night, and something that will say to them how grateful we are for the great work that our doctors, our nurses, our care workers have given to our entire community. Leader of the House. Um, 
Uh, Mr Speaker, first of all, the easy question to answer, that uh, Northern Ireland questions will next be held on Wednesday the 13th of May, and that will be an opportunity to raise with the Secretary of State uh, the Honourable Gentleman's second question about how the relationship between the Secretary of State, this Parliament and the Assembly will work, which is, I think, a matter for him. Uh, as for marches, um, what a wonderful idea. Um, I know that in Northern Ireland there is a great affection for marches, though they're sometimes quite controversial. I, I always think it's worth remembering, speaking as a Catholic, that the Holy Father in 1690 had a tedium sung in honour of the victory at the Battle of the Boyne of um, King William uh, because he wasn't getting on very well with Louis XIV at the time. Very <laughs> appalling! <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and uh, again, thanks uh, to you and your team uh, for enabling us to return to raise this very wide range of issues that we will want to be questioning ministers on. And uh, can I also put on record my thanks to the uh, team from the Treasury Select Committee who enabled us to meet quite a few times during recess in order to uh, probe on the economic issues. My uh, question is a parochial one, but nevertheless a very important one to my constituents, which is that just over two months ago, the town of Tembury Wells was very badly flooded, and that was uh, the top story in the news at the time. And uh, I wondered whether the Leader of the House could give an indication as to when the adjournment debate that I have on the subject, which has now been postponed twice, uh, will be able to be held. In for the House. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. My honourable friend is absolutely right to praise those running select committees. Uh, before we rose for Easter, it was thought extremely difficult to allow select committees to meet regularly, and by the time we got back, we can now have a regular uh, range of select committees meeting. It's been a hugely impressive effort uh, by um, the parliamentary staff. As for adjournment debates, as I mentioned earlier, it depends slightly on how long this procedure lasts, that we would seek to extend it to cover more and more business the longer it lasts, but my hope would be that it, we will be back to normal before that level of extension has been reached, in which case uh, matters of adjournment debates will be in Mr Speaker's hands, though I have a feeling that he will be sympathetic to requests to reinstate um, adjournment debates where members have been generous enough to allow them um, to not be taken. Sir Charles Walker. Thank you, Mr Speaker, for bringing us back here today. You've put a huge amount of effort into that, and I really do thank you for that. Also, could I, could I thank those hundreds, if not thousands, of my constituents who go to work every day mm -hmm. to make my life a little easier and the lives of my neighbours a little easier and those people I represent a little mm -hmm. easier? These people are doing a truly terrific thing, and they deserve all of our congratulations wherever they're doing it. Can I ask the, the Leader of the House, as he is a Cabinet Minister, whether we could look at the Retail, Hospitality and Leisure Sector grant and its scope? I think there are a number of businesses that are excluded from it, I think particularly those in the exhibition industry, who have seen their entire business evaporate, and it'll be, they'll be the first into this recession, and I suspect they'll be the last out. And can we also look at the Small Business Grant? There are a number of businesses that are excluded from this grant because their rates are bundled up with their rent yeah. paid to their landlord. Many yeah, of these yeah. are concessions or very small cafes or businesses, and they're missing out on the £10,000. And I really do hope the Leader of the House can convey that to the Chancellor. Leader of the House. Um, uh, Mr Speaker, all of us who are constituency MPs as well as ministers are aware of these issues being raised by our constituents. Uh, and the point he makes on rates when they're rolled up in rents is an obvious and important one. Um, Treasury questions aren't actually taking place uh, until the 18th of May, but of course the Prime Minister and therefore Prime Minister's questions um, are to the First Lord of the Treasury, and I'm sure the First Secretary will be able to answer his questions on these matters, but in the meantime I will take them up with the Chancellor on his behalf. Chris Lowder. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I should like to place on record my thanks to uh, the the, the healthcare professionals, the doctors and the nurses, and particularly our social care workers across West Dorset. But uh, I would like to ask the Leader of the House if he might make provision for a statement from the Environment Secretary on the state of farming and our food supply industry, which I am greatly concerned about at this time. We have had a number of uh, conference calls with uh, the National Farmers Union and others at the moment where it is very clear the dairy industry and the beef industry particularly are in great stress 
and I greatly fear for the future of the food supply chain. Leader, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, this is a matter of the greatest uh, importance, and I will pass on to the Secretary of State uh, his concerns. Um, questions to the Secretary of State for the Department of Food and Rural Affairs and the Environment are not immediate. They're, they're relatively late in the schedule on the 19th of May, so we'll see if this can be taken up uh, more directly and more swiftly. Antony uh, Mr Speaker, thank you um, to the Leader of the House for his responses this afternoon. And I actually join on the point that was made before last around business rates. Um, I, in my constituency, have had a lot of business rates uh, relief, and where the grant has come in, the small business grant has been exploited by, in certain cases, second homeowners. Will he uh, instruct and ask the Chancellor and his team to review how business rate reviews are dealt with and the relief is granted, and how these small business grants that are there for businesses at this time of need are issued, because they are being exploited? Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, as I understand it, that it is only available if um, second homes are genuinely used for businesses. So if they are used for business purposes, the grant is available. And I think that's fair and reasonable, as long as they are being used for business purposes. And that's, I understand, uh, how the grant is being applied. John Spiller. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I just go back to a subject I raised with the Speaker during the course of uh, sorry, the Leader of the House during the course of my contribution? about those large number of constituents who are still stranded in, the, in India, Pakistan and, uh, and, and, and Bangladesh. Many of them are, are, are elderly. The temperature there is rising enorm in, in, in enormously. Conditions are becoming un unbearable. There has been an, an improvement in the, uh, in the number of flights, but we're still well behind many other countries in that, particularly Germany. We need urgent additional flights in order to get these people home. Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the Government has made enormous efforts to bring people back, and the numbers involved are very large. I mean, 200,000 people have come back from Spain, 13,000 from Egypt, 6,000 from Pakistan, and 1,000 from New Zealand. So it has been a big effort by the Government, and particularly difficult when the number of um, uh, aeroplanes flying has been uh, reduced. Um, but may I suggest that uh, the right honourable gentleman may wish to raise this with the Foreign Secretary, the First Secretary of State, uh, when he's answering Prime Minister's questions tomorrow. Right. I understand that the 10 minute rule motion will not be moved. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Immigration and Social Security Coordination E Withdrawal Bill, second reading. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, motions three to five cannot be moved as they are consequential on the motion for second reading. The question is the House do now adjourn. Well, first of all, to move it. I beg to move this House do now adjourn. The question is this House do now adjourn. As many of that opinion say aye. Aye. The ayes have it, the ayes have it. Order, order. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>